Hello, I'm Tony Guida. This is my New York. Let me show you two classic pieces of graphic art. A poster of Bob Dylan with psychedelic hair and the I Love New York logo. Both created by Milton Glaser, the renowned graphic designer who died recently. Three years ago, on the 40th anniversary of I Love New York, Glazer recalled for me its unlikely conception. He also voiced alarm at the challenge to communicate authentically in an age when lies are deemed irrelevant. I read a quote of yours where you said there are three responses to a, to a piece of design. Yes, no, and wow. I think wow has been the reaction to most of what you've designed. And it's very kind of you, if not well, necessarily true. Well, it wasn't true at the beginning of the very famous I Love New York uh, design logo. I, I was surprised, well, maybe not surprised, but the beginning was a little, they weren't, they weren't uh, overwhelmed, were they, at the beginning? Well, the people who saw it uh, actually as a second choice, right. I, I submitted something that was very ordinary, rather banal. It was accepted as most works that are approved by committee are. One of the problems you have being in this profession and others like it is that the approval process tends to suck all the life out of the actual creation. A camel is a, a horse by As they committee. say, right, that, yeah. and it's true. And the reasons are, are perfectly uh, appropriate, which is to say that these are people worried about their jobs, they're worried about communicating ideas, and concerned about making the wrong move. I mean, such is the nature of bureaucracy. Well, tell us what happened in that case. Well, in, in our case, I did something very simple because I thought the campaign was going to last two weeks. <laughs> and I did the two lines of typography within lozenges, a very safe, ordinary thing. And it was submitted and it was accepted by the committee, five or six people. But then I was... Um, in a taxi coming to work, and it occurred to me that there was a better way of doing it. And it's almost inevitable way of doing it, I Heart New York, and I jotted that down on a piece of paper, and I called the assistant uh, commissioner of commerce, a guy named Bill Doyle, who had mm. given me the job. I said, I have something better. He said, oh, don't bug me. I just got this thing approved with those guys. I'll never get anything. I said, let me show it to you. So I went down to his office and I showed him, he said, you're right, that's better. And he actually reconvened this group of five, which is more of a job than one would think, and probably was the really most difficult part of the job. They got together and they said, you're right, this one's better, and that's how it happened. So uh, it was unusual. That is an inversion of what usually happens. What usually happens is you submit the good one it is rejected, and then you submit a mediocre right. one, and that's accepted. What, what is it about that? Well, I know, for instance, that you've said in other uh, circumstances, gee, I wish people would forget it. I've done other things. But everybody, of course, wants to talk to you about it. What is it that makes that design eternal? Eternal, we don't know yet. Um, there's one essential thing that really makes it more uh, more durable than other things, which is it's not a piece of advertising, and it is not intended to persuade. What it is is a reflection of how we were all feeling at the time. Which is really bad. We were feeling bad. The city was in bad shape. People were leaving like crazy. Of course, it was a great time to buy an apartment. But <laughs> it was a dark time. And it was, crime was, you know, way up. And uh, people were beginning to resent that. And so here was a voice that really was the voice of the people that said, I love New York. And that's how we felt. Those of us who wanted to stay and wanted to revive the vitality mm -hmm. and the interest of the city, we want to acknowledge that fact, and so we said, or we're able to say through this scrap of paper, I love New York. And therefore, it wasn't intended as a proposal so that somebody could make money off mm -hmm. it. 
It was really an expression of the reality that people felt here. And because of that, because it was real and it was informative, rather than persuading people to buy some other nasty piece of food that they didn't need or what other reason you had, it was authentic. And I think the, one of the tools that you have in communicating is a sense of authenticity. It's believable, especially now when nobody believes anything. There's nothing that is believed. So to penetrate that, that wall that now exists through our own experiences, because we've been lied to so often, something that tells the truth is remarkably persuasive. It requires the mind to make some fairly simple uh, yeah. Uh, connections. Yeah, that in a, in, a, in a technical way for people who are involved in communication it's true that uh, when you create a small puzzle not too difficult to solve the act of moving the brain to solve it sort of makes you remember it and in this case the the puzzle is a simple one it's I is a complete word the heart is a symbol for an emotion, and NY are initials for a place. So you have three little iterations that you have to go through in order to understand what you're looking at. Once you've solved the puzzle, and it, it puzzle, and it's easy, right? It can't be too hard. Because the opposite is if you see it, you can't figure it out, you turn away. So the puzzle has to be right at the fringes of your existing understanding. So th that's the secret, I think, to uh, the fact that it's been around so long. People look at it, they solve the puzzle, and they remember it. Well, it's not, not only been around seemingly forever, but it's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. It's, it's uh, in Asia, it's in Europe, it's in South America, yeah. it's, it's on the buses. On... Yeah, it's weird. And I realized that the, the reason for that is that people were looking for a way to say, I love. And Nobody had ever changed a noun into a verb or a verb into a noun and used a symbol uh, not, not quite rationally to express the feeling and quite in that way. So you find I heart, which everything. all the wise guys immediately said it's I heart. <laughs> I heart everything, right? You go, to, you go to, somebody told me they literally went to Africa and it was inside of a hut that they went into it was a I Love New York poster. Really? 1977, when you created that 40 years ago, New York indeed was a dark and dangerous place. It was. What, if you were asked by the state tourism people today to create a logo for this city and state, what might it be? I mean, there's some there's some dark things going on today. Well, I think what I was saying before is true. You have to avoid lying, and you, you, you've got to stop so much and telling people things that are not true or half true. I mean, this Trump era, which is an era of misrepresentation and deliberate lies, has to be compensated by something. The most important thing about communication is that to be effective, it has to be believed. And we are now, I have to say, in an unprecedented moment of disbelief. Nobody believes anything. And if it's a lie, it doesn't matter anymore. So the first thing you'd have to do is, in this context, what is it you could say that would penetrate somebody's mind and say, this guy is well intended towards me? What I say in teaching always is the same thing as doctors say to each other. First, do no harm. And I think in the communication business, whether you're in the magazine business or the newspaper business or even the advertising agency, that should be your first question. Do no harm. That's a real problem in advertising, incidentally, and it's why I'm very wary of advertising and I've always had a very arm's length relationship to it because the whole context of advertising is to encourage you to misrepresent and lie. And now people are, more than ever in history, I think, are very suspicious of the nature of what people are telling them. Especially in a time when we've been introduced to the concept, <laughs> it's ludicrous, but non nonetheless, of alternate facts, as if such a thing 
Sorry. actually existed. Right. Uh, it makes for cynicism. It makes for separation. Without any question. And I think that's the most profound question of our time for people like us who are supposed to be able to communicate to others. Uh, people in the media, people on television, people who basically live by conveying information to others. That question that at a time when no one believes anything and when the fact that something is a lie is irrelevant, how do you ever get, how do you get to them? Why should they believe you of all people? You've, you've designed, I'm, I'm told, you've designed a dump Trump pin. Yes, is, is uh, that good? Early, early in the game. You know, is it getting any attention? No, is it getting no, more, no? No, no. It, 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 you know, it, it just blows in the wind. All that stuff. I mean, that's uh, one of the things that's most discouraging is to see how irrelevant this stuff is. Every day you see a hundred thousand messages, and, and you just throw them into the into the garbage heap. I mean, because they have no relationship to your life. This question of believability, you know, what people believe, because it is fundamentally the structure of civilization, I mean, you have to have belief. You have to believe that there's an alternative to the misery that you're experiencing in daily life. I mean, but the question now is what to believe. Exactly, exactly. Speaking of uh, this president, you did some work for him long ago. Oh, don't rub it in. <laughs> <laughs> a Trump vodka bottle, which I, th I thought was a, a magnificent design. I yeah. mean, it really captures the spirit of a big, you know, an ego, egotist builder kind of thing. That, what, describe that bottle. Well, it's over here on the shelf. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a, it was just a, uh, it looks masculine. And uh, it has the, 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 I don't know if it's a real sense of scale and importance. Uh, he later got into a fight with the guy who was manufacturing the vodka. Oh, a big surprise. They, they sued each other. And I looked up in my records whether he had paid me, and it turned out he paid me half <laughs> for doing it and never fulfilled the other half of the bill. You're not the only person I know who did work for citizen Trump and is still waiting for payment. Yeah, well, I, have a no, few. No. I mean, now it's become, everybody knows. Legendary. You know, it, it, part of your, I, I, I don't want to try to uh, encapsulate your philosophy. You're better at talking about it than I am. But there's a sense of art as commonality, as bringing people together. Is a, as a function of art and very different, or at least um, I'm thinking of it relative to what you're talking about now, people yeah. being, you know, so uh, fractured, the, the society so fractured. Yeah. Is that something that, that comes out of your earliest, I'm, I'm thinking of the coops in the South Bronx, it, it where, you, where you grew up and where you... It, it's so funny because I just, I've been thinking about this because I'm, I'm writing an introduction to uh, the next book that I'm doing. And I was, I looked back on, uh, and we retrieved some material from the internet of a rent riot that occurred when I was growing up in the Bronx, where I was two or three years old, and we were thrown out of our house, we were literally thrown out of our apartment. Uh, there was a left wing, it was a communist enclave, and yeah, the I, coop stood for it was a it was a, it was a housing co cooperative. Well, housing so. cooperative, largely communists, uh, Eastern Europeans, and Germans. Very militant. I think it was the largest communist enclave in America. <laughs> there were a thousand families, right. and this was a rent strike because they were going to raise their rents. Nobody had any money during the depression, and a thousand people, a thousand families signed the petition and then went on strike outside and circled the building and they send in cops on the horseback and uh, my aunt Florence 
at that moment was coming out of the building carrying baby Milton because all our furniture was in the street. They had already removed them from the house. And when the uh, strikers saw me coming out in, in my aunt's arms, they rioted and they attacked the cops. And the cops fought back with billy clubs and smashed their heads in and sent them to the hospital. And, and I remember this and we sent away on the internet for pictures, and there was a picture of these big, burly guys on a horseback with people underfoot as they were smashing them in the heads. I didn't know what, as kids don't, what communism was or what the left wing or the right wing was, but I did know that there was a struggle in life between those who had it and those who didn't, and those who were the powerful ones and those who were submissive. And, uh, that idea of social equality, which wasn't linked to ideology, but was linked to the idea of being a good human being, I have to say, I use as the basis for everything in my life. And the way art comes into it, I have to say, is that art always seemed to be a mechanism for uh, people to feel they had a common purpose. You like Mozart, I like Mozart, we like Mer Mozart, we have something in common. And that its largest function was to establish that sense of commonality. That it, it was the means by which civilization determined it could avoid war and find something in common among people. Doesn't always work, but from my point of view, the existential reason for art is to improve the human condition by finding what binds us together. This is also the 50th anniversary of one of your most famous works, the Dylan poster, which is a marvelous um, evocation of the man and the times, the, 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 the turbulent 60s, 60, uh, what was it, 67. Yeah. I mean, it's not a portrait, it's just a profile and that flowing, billowing hair in rainbow colors seems to suggest to me like the, I don't know, the hippie, the, the whole thing going on at that time. It was. I mean, it was sort of representative of the way uh, things looked at the time. But the curious thing about that, that, that particular piece uh, and I've written about it, is derived from a portrait by Marcel Duchamp, a self-portrait with the addition of this psychedelic aura mm -hmm. around him that I derived from Art Nouveau because I was always interested in art history. So sort of two events in the history of art had nothing to do with Dylan at all, except for the idea of losing the logical part of your mind in favor of the sensate part of your mind. That was sort of the only continuity of it. And then it ended up as symbolic of a moment in time, even though its sources were so unrelated to that. Of course. It, it, it seemed to put you, what well, didn't seem to, it put you on the map for, you know, your designs were everywhere after that. And did that surprise you that, that, that this, this thing had such a gripping sure. uh, power on, sure. the, on the public? It, it's almost accidental also, because there are a gazillion pieces of art, so-called, that look almost like that. So you wonder, what, why that, right? With all the millions of choices people have in, for anything, right, for soda, for chocolate, bar, why that? What, what makes things iconic? Mm. Why, out of the millions of things that are produced, two are remembered for it's one of the great, the preferences. I mean, why do people prefer certain things and not others? The most fascinating subject you could imagine. But certainly I didn't expect anything special out of the Dylan poetry, except Dylan himself became so powerful as an idea, as a countercultural thing, 
that that was sort of swept along. If it were done for Rosemary Clooney, it wouldn't have had the same consequence. <laughs> well, too bad, because I, I enjoyed her singing so much. Um, we're in your studio in a building that you have had this studio for 55 years and upstairs too. It's been On the door is the motto, art is work. How do you mean that? Well, I don't know how I meant it at the, at the time. It was to sort of detoxify art as being this separate thing that only the privileged could do. And uh, the mystery about art is it's self-anointed. If you wanted to say you're an artist, you could say I'm an artist. And there's no way of telling whether you're telling the truth or not. There's no test for entry. What kind of world is that where anybody can declare themselves to be an artist? You can't, because nobody knows. And only history makes a judgment about that. What it is, it's work, and every once in a while, when it's looked at over the course of history, someone will pick it out and say, you know, this isn't work, this is art. So that distinction was something I wanted to make, that the idea that it is not self-anointing, that you have to wait it out until somebody says, this is art. And you were talking earlier about the difference between art and, um, but it, 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 making a differentiation that is actually a trick question. Tell me what you had in mind. Well, what people think very often is anything that's made, like a chair or a fabric or a rug, is necessarily a work of art. But that's not true. It's a work of craft, say, or a work of communication, say. But whether it enters into this other realm, this realm where you are transformed by it, the thing, the secret of art is that it is transformative, that you are no longer, I always say, you're no longer the same after sitting in front of the Last Supper for a half hour. You are no, your life has changed. You have changed. You have submitted to another view of life. And that has that, for something to be truly, in my judgment, art, it has to transform you. You no longer see the world in the same way. What you see, I believe, is what is real or closer to reality than you get when you look at most things. Well, speaking of art and the work that's been done here, there's, it, this place <laughs> has been, in some sense, in the best sense of the word, a factory, because just upstairs, you and Clay Felker created a magazine called New York. Uh, why? What, what was the need for another magazine then? Well, that's a good question as to why. The main reason why was Clay was out of a job. <laughs> <laughs> he had been doing the New, the New York as an insert in the Herald Tribune. The Herald Tribune right. went out of yeah. business. The insert went out of business. He was the editor. And he needed something else to do. And I was his buddy. And we said, let's do something together. We loved doing New York when it was in the uh, Tribune. And I did a lot of work for them. I started the Underground Gourmet when yeah. I was there. I, so I, I, I value that so much. I still have some, some copies of when it was the Sunday supplement. And then we found we could buy the name. I mean, it turned up mm. that the name was available. And uh, put some money together, we bought the name and started working furiously on the first new issue. What and did you want it to be? What was the well, it, animating it, principle? I think what we wanted it to be more than anything else was to inform the people who lived here about the real life of the city. I mean, magazines have their own stylistic and ideological commitment to how it reports things. And, and there's certain set, magazines have to have a certain sense of privilege that it sort of exudes so that the advertising will look more significant. I mean, uh, we wanted, I guess, for a magazine to truly reflect for a larger segment of the city population, not, not the best of the city, but for a broader 
spectrum of the city. And one of the things was something like cheap food. Uh, nobody would do a review of a cheap restaurant because they didn't advertise. So the magazines would never cover them. And that sort of thing where you were looking for the backside of the city that nobody was talking about because either was too low on the economic scale or not appropriate for criticism, or whatever it was, we went to explore a part of the city that wasn't completely covered by the existing newspapers and magazines and television. And, it's, and it persists. It does. It's, as we were saying, it's, it's still a very good service magazine. You've come to work in this building for more than 50 years, and you continue to come to work every day. Um, you obviously uh, have endless font, I guess, of ideas and things you want to get out there, but you, you never hesitate. This is something you want to do every day, come here and create. My greatest horror is to wake up in the morning and have no place to go. I mean, I look forward to discovering what I don't know. I still am finding things out that I never thought of before. Uh, but you could discover some of that, let's say, in an art museum, in the Met or the Louvre. It's, it's the making. I mean, ah, the it's making. the mind to the hand to the surface. It's the, uh, making things are the way to stay alive. I mean, that there's something that happens when something physical occurs from your thought. You know? To see the, the transformation of an idea that exists here down the neurological paths onto a piece of paper, more often than not, it's nothing. I mean, it's just another thing. Every once in a while, something extraordinary happens, and you're amazed that it does. Glazer's last design, as the Times reported, shows him still concerned about his beleaguered city. A graphical treatment of the word together. Milton Glazer, dead at 91.